It's a great pleasure to be with you today and to explore this relationship between active surveillance and focal therapy. My name is Mark Emberton. I'm Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences at UCL, and I believe and assert that active surveillance will get less and focal therapy will increase uh, with time. And I'll try and explain why I think that might be. So first of all, let's just reflect on active surveillance. It's a non-standardized approach to care. Uh, none of us do it the same. I think we'd all agree on that. And therefore, it's a kind of difficult thing to research and indeed understand. The ways into surveillance vary, the ways out of surveillance vary hugely. I think we'd all agree it's a strategy to mitigate the impact of overdiagnosis by reducing overtreatment or at least deferring treatment in some individuals. I think we'd all also agree that it's a safety net for poor risk stratification. Some centres uh, report 50% upgrading from biopsy to radical prostatectomy. That's a 50% error rate in terms of the risk stratification precision. Half the patients are incorrectly risk stratified. Active surveillance allows you to correct that by monitoring the putative low risk patients in case you've got it wrong. And some people have a 50% chance of doing that. And I think active surveillance is also a response to a medical error. And we might not all agree on this, but if no benefit can result from a diagnosis of microfocal Gleason 3 plus 3, if it doesn't change the date on which you are destined to die, then all we can do is incur cost and confer harm on the individual and the healthcare system. So, and that's obviously not a good place to be. I remember Chris Parker many, many years ago saying, well, active surveillance is a temporary solution to a current problem. And it may be that actually um, we're coming to the end of that period. And the reason we're coming to the end of that period is that we have a novel method of early detection and risk stratification, which seems to work much better than the old systems. This is uh, the paper we published that was led by my colleague Caroline Moore, which got a huge amount of press attention, largely because one of the outputs of the study, which I'll come to in just a second. So in summary, this was the first community-based, randomly selected exposure of MRI first to a population that had not been evaluated before. Invitations were sent out, patients accepted the invitation, they came in for it, short sequence MRI and a PSA. There were two ways to fail. One was a, if you had a PSA density of greater than 0.12, or if your MRI was abnormal. Of course, both could be present at the same time as well. If either or both were abnormal, you'd be referred on to secondary care, have a multi-parametric MRI and a biopsy in the usual way outside of the study design. This is a patient who screened negative, was reassured, sent back to his primary care for ongoing management for them to decide upon. This is a patient that's screened positive. You can see a lesion in the left anterior component of the prostate, occupying a good proportion of the prostate. This individual would have been told, the GP would have been told, and the referral would have been made on to secondary care. In summary, this approach, so an MRI first approach, resulted in the following yield. One in six men had a positive MRI. This wasn't a PIRAD score, it was positive or negative, and two independent radiologists had to agree. One in 20 had a raised PSA alone. One in 10 men were diagnosed with clinically significant disease by the usual criteria of Gleason 3 plus 4 or more. And only, and this is important for this conversation, only one in 100 men were diagnosed with Gleason 3 plus 3. So this is a very effective way at identifying a lot of clinically significant cancer. Remember, these lesions are all visible and there's only a one in 100 chance of labeling somebody as having Gleason 3 plus 3. The reason that this got a lot of press attention is that two thirds of the patients with clinically significant disease had a normal PSA, suggesting that a PSA first strategy is likely to be very ineffective at identifying bulky visible disease that is grade group two or more. So what cancers did we find? Well, I think MRI seems to detect cancers that would normally attribute to uh, high risk and normally want to treat. Remember, all of these had targeted biopsies because they were all lesions. It was the lesion that got you referred. And it's quite possible that the Gleason 3 plus 3s may have underreported pattern 4 within the lesion, as most lesions do contain pattern four. And the reason that I think this is going to change and fueling this change is going to be an increase in the role of MRI as an early detection strategy. In the UK, we're about to launch a screening study in which MRI first approach is going to be evaluated formally over nearly two decades. And the funding for that is now in place. And the study will start hopefully within the next six to nine months.
In future, I would argue and suggest to you that the future is going to be all about lesions. Modern MRI can identify lesions in a very, very early state. This is a 0.1 cc, might, might be even smaller than that lesion. It's almost certainly a cancer. Uh, we have three options. Uh, we can observe it, we can biopsy it, or we can treat it. But all three options involve some aspect of lesion management. We know that lesions progress in this study of our MRI-based active surveillance. We know that you know if you have visible Gleason 3 plus 4 disease, you do not spend long on active surveillance. If you have invisible Gleason 3 plus 3 disease, you spend a long time on active surveillance. So visibility seems to matter. We know also that the visible lesions are associated with much higher Gleason grade, obviously with much higher burden. Uh, these are bigger cancers. Normally a visible lesion has at least 100 million cancer cells. And we also know that I'm not gonna show you today that the gene expression is very, very different in visible versus non-visible lesions. And you'd expect that to be the case. Lesions differ in terms of their epidemiology. This is a lesion I've been watching since 2018 in the left anterior horn of the prostate. And you can see that over five years, it hasn't shifted. The patient's PSA has remained the same. This cancer is being held in check by the person's immune system. The balance of proliferation and apoptosis seems to be very, very well placed at present and has lasted some five or six years. What we tend to see, though, is that there are periods of stability with lesions and then onward progression. The other thing we can do with the lesion is, is, is treat it. This lesion in the left peripheral zone of the prostate is exhibiting quite a bit of capsule abutment. I don't think you'd want it to get any bigger because you'd be worried about T3A progression. It's also reasonably close to the urethra. And this lesion, which is at the base of the prostate and can be seen on all the sequences, can be treated, again, using, in this case, high-intensity focused ultrasound. It's almost a theranostic. You image it, and you treat it with an imaging-based system. Although we're treating on an ultrasound platform, the MRI information has been imported using the image fusion. We're applying the anterior margin at present. We're applying the treatment onto the tumor. After this, there's a posterior margin, and you can see the lateral and medial margins uh, being applied at present to this. And here you can see the kind of sagittal view, uh, which can be adjusted uh, and is dynamic throughout the treatment process. So in summary, if a lesion is present, given what we know, is its mere presence a justification for treatment? Given that lesions have a bad prognosis, and share the data with you, but if you have a lesion, you're much more likely to die of prostate cancer than if you don't. Why would we allow a lesion to grow? It will always be more difficult to treat in the future. It will be bigger at some point. So that's a kind of interesting question dilemma and goes against the traditional notion of delayed selective intervention. Can we risk stratify lesions as progressors or non-progressors? Can we get some sense of whether this lesion is likely to remain stable over several years or indeed is destined to grow and proliferate? Well, at the moment, the only way to do that is to watch them. Uh, we do that with lots of lesions. Some progress quickly, some progress don't. We need to know why that is. And it may be that the gene expression within the lesion or the germline genetics of the individual or indeed the immune system of the individual may be important in that. And the other important thing in lesion management will be predicting whether or not a second or third lesion will occur. So in other words, where we are in the story, are we at the beginning, middle or end of the story? Has this lesion been present for 10 years and we're just spotting it now? Or has it just appeared and others are destined to appear over the next year or two? And again, here, the germline information, but also the information of the gene expression within the prostate tissue might again be helpful. So thank you. I hope that's been stimulating and, and slightly provocative and will form a basis for discussion later on today. It's been a pleasure speaking to you.